Hey there, folks. We're all here. Welcome back to uh, the tenth episode of the Untitled TTRPG podcast. But uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, world building. We'll we'll jump right into it. Why should we world build at all? Actually, we should probably define it. What, what is world building, John? So about a year and a half ago, I had a whole series of podcasts over on Dragon Mind, which you can also find on Spotify. Uh, just talking to different DMs about world building and. My personal definition is it's just establishing the setting and the context of the story. Like the dictionary definition says that it has to be fictional and a different place than our reality. Although um, one of my pastimes is I like listening to like uh, television rewatch podcasts with the cast, kind of like a commentary thing. And um, what, what I found interesting myself is just they'll refer to world building as just when you establish continuity within a series. So if there's like a running joke that they reference from a past episode, they'll refer to that as world building. So I think in a lot of ways, when you're talking about it, it's really just the continuity and the rules of the setting. Yeah, I think a lot of people hear that word. And then there's a there's this reaction to where like, oh, you got to create a Tolkien esque, you know, setting to encapsulate the, the campaign that you're going to be running and your you know players have to live with that. And we will walk through all of this, but uh, that's not the case. Not at all. I think uh, even the Dungeon Master's Guide from 2014 uh, mentioned that world building is as simple as if you walk into a shop and you talk to the shopkeeper and say you have a conversation with them. If the players revisit that shop, even like two or three days later in the game story and the shopkeeper remembers them, that is world building because the same individual has this continuity that's been established that um, that they're adhering to. Yeah. So with that being the case, uh, why why should you take your first steps into uh, to world building? The two big reasons I think uh, first, it just gives uh, context and tone for the story you're telling. So, for example, if you're going to play an RPG in the Star Wars universe that's probably going to have a very different tone than one set in a universe more similar to like Resident Evil. Like both of those experiences can be really fun, but the player's expectations, um, the vibe that they're going for, the kind of stories they want to tell are going to be completely different because of those two different worlds. The other thing I found is that world building, in my experience, is the number one way to demonstrate to the players that their choices matter. So if you can somehow demonstrate that hey, because you saved this town, um, now the trade route is open again. And some, I don't know, far away uh, economics are relieved because of something you've done. These little world ways that you can show that your choices matter um, really encourages the players to keep playing and maintain their interest. If you enter the TTRPG uh, space with the intention of playing a collaborative game, I think world building it lets it lets your players feel more a, a part of the process by virtue of observing those little continuity uh, points that you, you mentioned. You know, even if even if they're not actively um, constructing, like, hey, let's make a town over here. That that doesn't need to be how they uh, help you kind of build uh, something larger than itself. But what are <laughs> what are some of the reasons that you should not world build? throw a curveball at you. Yeah, well, I think that it, 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 again, goes back to your definition and how you kind of frame world building. So I think that if you think of it purely as keeping continuity, there's no reason not to. But what happens, I find, is a lot of especially newer GMs that are super excited about creating an expansive world just highlight the wrong details. So for example, um, you might be doing a, a standard plot of like save the blacksmith's daughter, but the DM is really excited about sharing the, the steel trade stocks or something, some random involved detail that has nothing to do with the situation at hand. And they over explain something they're excited about losing sight of what the players would care about. Now, if, you know, so for whatever reason you're playing a game, I don't know, like Monopoly or something that involves in, in that kind of detail, then those details become important. But I find that a lot of DMs get distracted by all the possibilities that they don't focus in on the thing that's going to be relevant for their players. 
And being relevant is, is I think, the, the key point there where it, it can be you know, really exciting to, to build something this broad and expansive because you do feel like you have a sense of ownership and that ownership is empowering. Just giving yourself the, um, the ability and the space to create can also be very empowering. But you can't also expect your players to care about that, uh, especially when it's not relevant to uh, to what they're trying to achieve within a session or a campaign. And that's something that we we tend to get caught up on. And it's easy to to burn yourself out too by going too broad too quickly. It was just interesting because yesterday's episode of the Eldritch Lore cast was Sean Merwin and Ben Byrne um, interviewing Mackenzie Diarmas and Justice. I can't remember his last name. Yikes. Uh, but uh, one of the things that he was saying was in the 2014 Dungeon Master's Guide, you open up the first page and it's immediately into cosmology and pantheons. So if you are a new DM, you would think that's where you need to start world building wise even though in a lot of D&D stories, that tends to be higher level play. You don't even get into planes of existence until post 10th level. So even the way they're constructing the new Dungeon Master's Guide is starting with something a little more local and usable and then expanding outward if your game gets that far. Now, something like Distal, when you initially were talking to me about it, it's called the Distal Plane because it's fractured. So right baked into the world building, and this could have changed since the last time we talked about it, but it makes sense that you would talk about the cosmology because even the, the test game I played with you, we were battling elementals that had leaked through from another plane, even at low level, that was the setting of the story. So it made sense to explain the planes of existence because that's what we were dealing with. It's funny because the the emphasis was in fact on, on the fact that these sorts of occurrences can happen because of the setting. And I think if you if you don't give your players a chance to experience experience the world that you've you've created, then it's a bunch of wasted time, unless it's just for you, which is fine too. Just just realize that there is a separation. So how how should we approach world building? So kind of like what I just said with Distal, um, the best world building advice that I've ever implemented was from uh, a TTRPG channel called Taking 20. Um, and he just said, when you world build, have the world building uh, wrap around the gameplay you want your players to experience. Um, and I thought that was brilliant because the idea is a lot of times, again, amateur world builders will put in these irrelevant details. You know, if you want your players to do like a standard monster hunting game, keep the details relevant to that. If you want them to do something more political intrigue, well, now you have a different set of mechanics and a different set of spells or abilities or whatever your system does that really emphasizes that kind of gameplay. So yeah, whatever whatever you're going to world build, that's how I would start is just first determine what part of the game your players are going to be interacting with the most and then have your lore details uh, revolve around that. Yeah, I'm really partial to to this uh, this idea of, of building uh, what you're doing that session and then either the next session or like just just beyond the horizon. So what could they, uh, the, they being the players um, or the characters, move toward? You know, what's, what's kind of local to them? And then make those details relevant. And world building, it, it doesn't have to be just the, the kind of meta structure around everything, like we've mentioned a, a couple of times so far already. But like if I, if I tell you that you're going to a new town, I, I want to make that town identifiable so that you can revisit it later and uh and there, there's some sort of impact the the point is to to start small be relevant and reach a little bit further and if you can try to make the players want or uh, key in on what the players are interested in as you play through that session if they say like oh maybe the next town over is going to have like this guard presence and then we'll be able to ask them for help maybe that's something you should figure out <laughs> so that you can incorporate it uh, one way or another. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would also say it's the longer you play with the same group of players, the more honed in you can get to their tastes and also um, the level of complication that they can handle. 
uh, because sometimes if something is too complex, they'll get hung up on the wrong details. Uh, great little story of this is, uh, you know, we have a mutual friend, Ian, and in one of his first games, he was a brand new dungeon master and he just wanted to test out a description. So he started to describe this well and the uh, player group he had was metagaming and they're like this well must be really important and they spent like an hour investigating this mundane well just because of his description uh so sometimes you have to know your players and if they're newer absolutely start small get them get their feet wet get them used to the game if they're a little more experienced and they're ready for some other kind of world building i i found a lot of success starting with like a continent sized map with some very general, bigger political dynamics, but without zooming in too close that I couldn't make up stuff on the fly, like you said. So that way you can hint like this kingdom here is having a little bit of an issue with this duchy over here or something. Um, so that way you can fill like bartender rumors, but nothing so specific that you're locked into something else. Yeah, I'm a big fan of, uh, of working in threes whenever I can, because... I mean, you, you don't need to, to do even that much, but if you have three big regions of the world, three big empires, three major religions, you know, those sorts of things, it's, uh, it's enough to give you a, you can create connections that aren't one dimensional. Uh, you know, if it's, if it's just two factions and they're like, ah, oh, they're, they're always head to head, that might be, that might be good for, for some things, especially if you want to keep it clean, understandable. But if you're looking for um, something that kind of grows into uh, some branching narrative or something more complex, then threes are like a really safe place to be. If you do more than that, it's, it's going to matter less because uh, there's just too much going on in the world. Uh, even when it comes to um, making, like making up towns. So I, I have a, loca uh, a location generator in, in Distal. And one of the things that it does is like, okay, what's the, what's the, the history of the place, what are the, the people and what are the secret that the people know. Um, when you create a, just even a visual identity for a space, it can be good to create one big, uh, just eye catching, I guess, uh, sort of, you know, a major statue or some identifying landmark. And then like two other functional elements within the town. So like, is there a shop that they can go to? Is there, you know, uh, an open field that's you know desolated or something like that. So just points of, of intrigue, but keep it uh, minimal enough to where it can be expanded upon when the players show interest in one thing or another. Yeah, the three thing is also, I think that's a great story structuring tool as well. Um, I think to... Uh, some games that I've run like uh, Sunless Citadel from Tales of the Awning Portal is like this. So you have the player characters, they have their interests and objectives. In that dungeon, there are two other factions. There's the goblins and the kobolds. And neither one is necessarily good or evil, depending on your definitions, yada, yada. But, you know, you could have the player characters side with the kobolds and that yields one result. Or the player characters may choose to side with the goblins and that yields a different result. So, and the player characters may just decide to attack both camps um, and just wipe, wipe everybody out. So, but the idea is that when you have three, rather than having it just be a very simple good guys, bad guys approach, now the players have just a little bit more choice in how the story ends up going down a certain route uh, based on what their own interests and objectives are. You know, I, I talked about the compelling aspects of creating a town and that sort of thing, but what are some other ways to make a setting feel compelling, really to draw in the players and make them invested, make them care? A lot of, so I'll say right up front, uh, you can run into problems if you're trying to subvert expectations way too too often. So, so where do we kind of draw that line? It's a really good question. And the best answer I can come up with is uh, real. it comes back to something we talked about with expectations with Baldur's Gate, uh, which is having a strong session zero can prime your players to be compelled. So if uh, one of the games uh, I, I talk about with some, some friends is there, there was once a game we were playing and the, the 
premise, the promise was that this was a super dark, gritty game where magic casting is punished. So not only punished legally, but there are unintended effects that can come out. But when it came to actually playing the game, um, 90% of the party were magic casters and nothing bad usually happened when they casted magic. So what happened was we had like, we're like, oh, that's a compelling premise, right? It subverts the expectation of regular D&D. But then because there was no follow through on it, it felt almost like, like we didn't, the promise wasn't fulfilled. So I found that my games became more compelling for my players when I was very upfront on the promise of the game I was going to deliver. And then I kept that promise. And then every now and then, like one out of every 10 sessions, maybe I'd try to subvert their expectations. Yeah, the uh, the one every, every 10 session thing, I think is that's a pretty safe benchmark. Because, you know, anytime that you're building something, it you, you need to aim for some level of familiarity uh, so that you know, just like touchstones. So dwarves are like you, you have an understanding of what dwarves should be. And if the GM is like, no, our dwarves are actually more like orcs and they're born in eggs and, you know, whatever else. That's that's all well and good. But it's like you, you can't just pull the rug out from underneath people. So that kind of you need to, to kind of gel with people's understanding of, of how things should be or at the very least uh, give them ways to interact that help shape the uh, shape the world over time or their understanding of the world over time instead of just like hitting them with some stuff that that doesn't really make sense because then instead of getting people in, interested in like oh that's that's intriguing i've never seen that done before you're so smart you know <laughs> you don't want any of that what you want is for them to feel more connected um instead of divested from the their narrative that you're trying to create yeah and i think a lot of it has to just do with timing um i found that uh when game masters uh, are planned to be excited to subvert expectations and then they get disappointed that like the shock and awe wasn't as big as what they were expecting. Um, it's just because they kind of did it too early without enough setup. So part of the subversion of expectation is how well you set it up and sell the party on that their actions or outcome is going to be one way. And then the subversion also isn't a complete flip all of the time. Sometimes it's like it's a little thing that just adds that little bit of twist that um, that gets them thinking completely differently. So, you know, you had a you were making me laugh with uh, <laughs> dwarves in an egg or whatever. Like it that would be like really funny if, say, like the party was expecting to meet a dwarf. And then it turns out they were just meeting a really small bird folk. It was a dwarf for their culture, but it was just someone something a little bit different than what they were expecting. Yeah, it's like uh, don't don't introduce uh, too many flaws and crazy on the first date. <laughs> you know, you kind of gotta gotta ease them into that a little bit. Um, yeah, you don't need to know all my kinks. It's it's fine. We'll <laughs> we'll figure that out if you if you get past the first session. Um, the <laughs> I'm so sorry, John. <laughs> No, it's it's cool. Um, it just that subverted my expectation. <laughs> there we go, nailed it. Uh, so when when it comes to compelling settings, uh, you know, we already talked about focusing on the things that players care about. It can be difficult to sometimes layer texture on the top of an idea without uh, being too abstract. This is it's it's difficult for me to articulate how to do this correctly, but. It's something that you learn by virtue of of writing. If you read uh, The Iron Druid by, I, this is a whole series, but I, I can't remember the author. Um, one of the things that the main character, Atticus, does is reveal his powers and, and understanding of like his own history of why he knows certain things over time. So it doesn't fire hose you with everything. And every little breadcrumb makes you it helps you piece together the world that he is uh, a part of the world that he's been uh just kind of like survived for a thousand plus years or whatever and it makes you more interested in that ramp up is is kind of what you want to strive for when doing world building again this all comes back to starting small then you know gradually scoping out 
but it can also be it can be good to uh, to sometimes not even sub- subvert expectations, but kind of like like create a really punchy detail that is easy to remember. So when I say that there is a a massive uh, gold statue that bleeds from its eye sockets in the middle of an open field with grain that is or surrounds it for miles, that that might be something that draws attention. What do you do with that? I don't know. But the point is that if you pepper those in every once in a while, it does help provide character to the world. Uh, I'll also take it a step further and say, if you have mechanics that support the features that you are implementing in your world, that helps tie everything together. We can too often look at a game as two separate parts. Like there's the story, the world, and then there's this you know fun combat game that, that lives over here somewhere. And that shouldn't be the case. I think that for GMs that are wondering whether or not their content is compelling, the the best indicator I can say to look out for is uh, how frequent and what are the quality of the kinds of questions that your players are asking based off of your details. So if they're asking really deep questions or really dive or uh, a lot of different questions, that means that they're probably interested because they care enough to know about the answer. One of the things that I it's it's interesting is once the questions become Basically, how do we just get to the next part? <laughs> it means you're probably doing a little too much. There's a little too much fire hosing. It's either a little bit irrelevant. And one of the things that you just demonstrated with the statue with the bleeding eyes is just keep your descriptions concise. Um, it's when you go off way too long <laughs> trying to describe everything up front, like you said, that players will get bored. In uh, adventure modules, like death knell for some of those things is just having too much read aloud text. The The point really should be to give enough information so that players can formulate questions and then you extend into it. They're just like having a conversation with a person. They need a chance to speak <laughs> or else they can't stay engaged. So even if you have more to say, you can still save that for later. So it really is an art form to try to figure out to give them enough details that they can start asking good questions, but not over explaining so much that they have no questions more to ask. You know, I'm, I'm definitely, I've done that on numerous occasions. Sometimes I just want to share a detail because it is interesting to share the detail. And I think it depends so heavily on on the table that you're playing with, because some some people, Steph, is like, I need to know the three relevant details so that we can in- investigate those details, and then they need action steps to to move on to to the next thing. And sometimes, especially as a GM, like when you're trying to to layer. I guess like like texture of the world. Not everything needs an action step is is my my take, but but the players aren't always going to see it that way. So you you do have to cater your world building to the people that you're serving. It could be frustrating. No, absolutely. And that's why I think to go back to one of your earlier questions, you know, why wouldn't you world build? It really comes down to your players' preferred style and what they're there for. So, and, and to be honest, some players just, they, for whatever reason, don't have the capacity to appreciate too many complications without feeling like they have to act on it. Like you said, um, not talk about you, Steph in particular, just like, yes, you know, you, you can't, you can't run Skyrim with all the pretty mods if you don't have a CPU to process all of them. So, oh, man, the, so the side quest, the very specific example, the side quests in Skyrim will ensure that you never actually finish the main storyline. So when it comes to world building, the level of detail that you provide is very important when you want to get people to the other side. So you were talking about the well. It's like, oh yeah, what's the well? There's a reason that doors are a big problem and a meme within the D&D community because, because it can be suspicious. You never know what's on the other side. What do you, you know? And and those sorts of things can bog down the game. So be careful, I think, what you give descriptive text about. And you can take players out of the experience for for a little bit and say, 
this isn't really anything that the that the players should be or your character should be concerned about. It's just a flavor uh, of the world, you know. And then even point to like the things that actually might have interest for for the characters. Yeah, that is absolutely what I was going to say too. Is just that the one benefit of a TTRPG over a video game, which you as the player have to follow the game's programming, um, is that as the designer, along with the per- the narrator. You can you can just step out of the game for a moment. One of the uh, Stephanie has actually thanked me personally for like I can see the players are like this door is suspicious and we might get into an hour long discussion over all the ways we could approach the door. And as the DM, I just step out of the game real quick and say, all right, just to save the hour long discussion that ultimately won't matter. As the narrator, it's fine. You can just walk through the door. Uh, and yeah, so really, if you are someone that really wants to create that textured experience. A big part of it is going back to session zero and either recruiting players that are going to appreciate that style or um, having the patience to train your players to that style. So that's what I always found as a a professional game master is uh, I was getting really frustrated that my players basically couldn't handle more than very simple combats. If if I put like legendary actions or anything, they would immediately get really frustrated. So over time, I had to very patiently start to introduce like breadcrumbs little by little, different mechanical combinations or complications until they were able to process it. And then even then it's a day by day thing. Some days they just want a simple combat. Some days they can handle something a little more complicated. So that that is the trouble with working with people, but it's also the beautiful thing is you're working with people. The next steps are the first steps. Like just start doing it because uh, you know you're going to accumulate that that experience over time. You're going to feel out the table over time, and don't don't feel like everything should be perfect. Um, don't be paralyzed by the fact that you can do everything. Just start from the the session, and then you know you'll you'll figure out how much you can do, what is compelling uh, as you as you kind of partake in that experience. Use a pen and paper, I, I mean, or, or Google Docs or, or whatever, like record your sessions, make a mental note whenever players have questions that, uh, or, or if they key in on certain details that you didn't expect them to key in on, make a note of that, uh, especially if you're not one, like a person who can kind of track all that stuff by, by feel and just, just mentally, just write it down. And then that will help you build out more uh, compelling, relevant, uh, appropriately scaled uh, pieces of the the world as you go. Cool. Well, I think that is about it. Hopefully, you found something uh, interesting, helpful, or entertaining. And if you did, please feel free to like, subscribe, tell your friends about the channel. And I'll link the the show on Spotify as well if you want to go subscribe to, to that. Thanks very much, folks. We're all signing off.